Kia ora, Jack. Well, welcome to the Both Sides Now podcast. Appreciate having you on. Kia ora, guys. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Likewise. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you on. Hey, so Both Sides Now, you know a little bit about what we're up to, but the general premise behind the podcast is myself being young Labour, Eve being young Nats, trying to break down political polarisation, come, come across the aisle and reconcile on these issues. And I guess um, the foundation of the podcast was built out of the rise of um this american style culture wars that we we're sort of seeing encroaching in on new zealand um the rise of online disinformation and clickbait style journalism so um i, I guess we're, this this was in a sort of an attempt to combat that and and bring it to young people bring politics to young people in a way that's really engaging and sort of bridges um bridges opinions uh, across the political spectrum so i guess we'll start off um by just getting your impressions on the current media landscape and you know how concerning is polarization to you in a, in a new zealand context um okay well i'll start off with the the media landscape and mm. then we can talk about polarization perhaps um so uh, i i think first of all that the new zealand media is in trouble uh in that uh the financial models that dictate a lot of the ways that we get news have been uh, under threat for some time and and ma haven't facing massive problems for some time and that's as we've seen the rise of the digital giants take away a lot of the advertising revenue but even simple things like um how do you guys what do you do in the evening if you got a bit of time free do you say to yourself oh my goodness it's 7 30 i'd better switch on the tv for my favorite show that starts at exactly this time no you go, I'm going to watch Netflix or I'm going to watch TVNZ On Demand. I'm going to watch things on my own schedule as my time allows. And there are lots of different things competing for our attention, for our eyeballs. And that makes things for, and that makes business for media companies way, way, way more difficult than it was 20 years ago. Um, and, and uh, you know, I think that as the the, the business models for, for media has become more tricky and it's become harder for media companies to make money inevitably they have had to make cuts and as they've made cuts the some of the um some of the work being produced by our newsrooms perhaps isn't at the standard that it was mm. in the past some of it is still don't get me wrong excellent like amazing journalism but um just the pressures faced by people who create news in new zealand today um, I think far exceed the pressures that existed there in the past. So my my first look at the media landscape would be to say that um, all of the media companies in New Zealand, with maybe Radio New Zealand being the one exception because it's entirely government funded, all of them are facing massive funding pressures at the moment. And that bleeds through to the ways in which we get information from traditional, um, traditional media streams or avenues. Um, I was fortunate enough to live in the States for five years. And I remember the first thing that struck me when I moved to America was how partisan media was. So, and, and this is something we see in lots of comparable countries, right? Um, Australia, to a certain extent, the UK, to a certain extent, uh, the US, very much so. You know, basically every major newspaper, every television network has a pretty explicit media bias. Um, and I personally am of the belief that that's contributed to um, to a sense of tribalism in some of those markets that is really unhelpful. So when I think about tribalism in the New Zealand context, um, the I, I think we're fortunate to have a media that is, for the most part, relatively neutral. And I know that people will always, you know, um, pick individual examples for things in which they think, oh, the media is maybe not... Um, doing a great job of representing all sides or representing all sides equally or whatever. Um, but I think when I compare, you know, the, the, the main ways in which New Zealanders rely on traditional media forms for getting their news, the likes of Stuff, The Herald, TVNZ, TV3, Radio New Zealand, um, I think for the most part, we are served by media that isn't really partisan in a way that it is overseas. And I think that's a great thing. Because uh, I, I agree that tribalism is a massive problem, uh, probably an increasing problem in New Zealand, although we are nowhere near, we have nothing like the the political environment and tribalism problem that... Say, Why do you think it is so different between New Zealand and, and the States? I mean, having, uh, having you know, covered, covered um, stories in both countries. Um, I think, first of all, I think... Um, 
we're we're relatively lucky in that um, we have a the MMP system means that it isn't just a two party system. Mm -hmm. So that's if we go right back to like, the constitutional framework, MMP at, at the very least means that we have a diversity of voices in Parliament, whether or not we actually have um, you know radically different uh, laws that are passed by different governments. That's a different you know, or different reforms passed by different governments, that's perhaps a different point. But we do have a plurality of voices that I don't think they necessarily have in some of those, some of those overseas markets or, uh, uh, you know, overseas political environments. Uh, right. I think the social media uh, influence in some of those environments has been far greater. I also think that um, there are kind of broader economic factors that have played a big role in tribalism that New Zealand has been relatively sheltered from. And so if we're to take the UK and the US, for example, part of the um, part of the momentum that propelled uh, Donald Trump's um, election, uh, part of the momentum that propelled Brexit was you had this massive slab of the population who had relatively uneducated relative to other parts of the country um, who had grown up on the promise of industry. So they had grown up in as baby boomers in the post-war period, a period of massive economic growth once they got through the first difficult few years where they were taught, you know what, you, you can have a high school education and you can be the foreman in a factory earning a good middle-class wage with two cars and a warm house and all your family are fed and it's a really secure kind of life that you'll create for yourself. They were growing up with this promise, but then by the time they got to the mid nineties and beyond, once some big free trade deals were signed, like, like NAFTA, the North American free trade agreement, I think um, the promise of industry all of a sudden got ripped away from those communities. So in the Midwest, for example, and in, in the Rust Belt in America, all of those jobs, all of those great factory jobs, building stuff, doing things, creating industry, building a better country, all of those got shipped off overseas because big corporates were like, why would I make stuff in America paying someone $7.50 an hour if I can be paying someone in China $2.50 an hour? And so I think you had a massive slab of the population in the US and, and the UK, in the North, for example, uh, in areas where they'd relied on industry and they relied on things like mining, um, who found themselves objectively poorer than their parents' generation. And it's a kind of inherent um, expectation of human beings that with every generation, we have a slightly higher level of prosperity. And I'm sure if you guys think about what your life was like for your parents when they were your age, they were probably poorer than you are now. You, you should have a slightly higher standard of living. And I think that kind of expectation permeates everything in our lives. So um, I think in the US and the UK, you had a massive slab of the population all of a sudden found themselves poorer than their parents' generation. And they were looking for someone to blame. They were looking for reasons why. Fortunately, in New Zealand, we haven't been affected by those same global economic factors. Mm -hmm. So those people in America, tens of millions of people who, who uh, find themselves poorer, were looking for a political outlet. And when someone came through, a populist who said, you know what, it's the system's fault. This is the reason why you've trusted all these politicians. I'm the anti-politician. It meant that people latched onto that message. And the, exactly the same thing happened with Brexit, I think, to, more or less. People latched onto that message. They, they looked for um, an explanation as to why they were poorer than their parents' generation. Fortunately, in New Zealand, we haven't been subject to the same kind of economic dynamic. And so I think um, that's a major factor why we haven't necessarily gone down the tribal pathway in the same way that they have in the US. Very quickly, sorry, the other factor is social media. Social media and its algorithms, we all know this, totally play into biases, right? So um, it feeds you more of what you want to see. And if, if what you are seeing in your social media feed is someone who says, it's not your fault you're poorer, someone else has screwed you over, the system has screwed you over, and you like that, and your friends like that, you get more of it, and more of it, and more of it, and more of it, and more of it. And, and it's like a snowball effect, right? Effectively, you get yourself into a position whereby you cannot see the other side. And so I think in some of those big comparable countries, they've got to a point where actually the people over here have such a different perception of reality to the people over here and neither of them are interested in finding any kind of middle ground. They're only interested in winning and having their opinion validated.
So aside from social media, do you think New Zealand has any factors that in the, you know, the short, medium, long term that could make us susceptible to kind of ending up that way? I do. I do think um, we face our own unique economic pressures and, and so much of politics is decided by economics, right? Like so much of um, like we talk about it heading into elections all the time. Like so many people's votes are decided by their pocketbooks. They think which party or which policy platform is going to leave me slightly better off financially than any other one. So I do think there are some um, economic dynamics that, that could potentially threaten um, some of the the some of you know these kinds of issues happening here, or could potentially risk these kinds of issues happening here. The obvious ones to me are the way in which there is clearly a tension between New Zealand's international brand, the brand that it tra trades on, being clean, green, one hundred percent pure New mm -hmm. Zealand, and uh, and and the reality that producing a lot of dairy, producing a lot of agricultural commodities also produces a lot of carbon emissions, right? Or a lot of um, carbon equivalents, you know, methane. Um, and I think that that is a really, really tough like circle to square or square to circle. I, I, I don't think we're at a point where we've found out, um, found a way that we can happily uh, marry our, the, the, our reliance on on some of those agricultural exports and our economic um, mm -hmm. our economy's dependence on those, with where we think we need to be in order to sustain that brand. And so I think that um, whereas some of the divisions overseas have been between industry and urbans, like urban elites, so say um, the Rust Belt in the U.S. and the elite coasts, Silicon Valley in the U.S. Northeast. Or in the UK, uh, the industrial north versus you know London and the elite south. Um, I, I can see there being uh, risk around a, a kind of urban rural divide in New Zealand, and the values that urbanites in Auckland might have being very much at odds with the values that New Zealanders in regional parts of the country might have. I do think that's a risk. I also think. Um, that uh, because we are so dependent on China um, as our largest trading partner, and clearly there are like geopolitical tensions between China and our traditional partners, the US, the UK, Australia, I think that has the potential to throw our economy into a very tricky position in the future if we have to make, if we're forced to make tough decisions like binary decisions between, you know, about our trading relationship with China. Um, I can see that having flow on effects um, that can, you know, potentially potentially lead to some unhealthy divisions in New Zealand. But I would say that I don't think um, uh, I don't think the 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 risks in New Zealand are necessarily as great as we've seen in the US and and the UK, for example. Mm -hmm. It's interesting in the reasons you give, they all very much economic based. Do you, so do you think that because people kind of blame COVID and they blame Jacinda Ardern for a lot of the div growing division in New Zealand um, and kind of the mandates and that sort of stuff. Do you, do you think that that division is, was kind of potentially more created by the media or is a bit more surface level than people actually think? Yeah, I think, um, I think the, um, I think the, the mandates certainly caused um, the, the mandates have certainly caused discontent, but I think that it is a relatively small minority, relatively small. That's not to say that it's an insignificant minority, but I do think relative to some of the other divisions, it is a relatively fringe issue. Um, I, I think uh, upon reflection, even even the Prime Minister now, Chris Hipkins, says that, for example, he thinks the final lockdown in Auckland went on longer than it should have. And if he had the information he has today when they made the decision to extend that lockdown, then uh, they, they might not have made the same decision. Um, extraordinary times call for extraordinary leadership and extraordinary decision making. And it can be pretty hard to, um, to distinguish what was the, the right and the wrong call. But I think it was kind of inevitable, personally, that if you were going to make decisions like they did to effectively shut New Zealand's borders, to introduce 
very, very strict mandates when it came to vaccinations, that you were going to have a big, a big pushback against that. I think the media's role is to reflect some of that pushback. I don't personally feel that the media reporting of the pushback was irresponsible in any way. I think for the most part, well, yeah, I can't think of any prominent examples that immediately spring to mind in which, um, uh, you know, in which those uh, voices or those concerns, I think, were given disproportionate coverage. I don't think that was a major issue. But I also think it would have been really um, irresponsible for the media not to report on that stuff. Because if, if you imagine the, the a world in which the media never acknowledged um, you know, any any hesitance towards vaccine mandates. I mean, there's hesitance towards vaccines and then there's hesitance towards vaccine mandates, right? Like the, go the, the government is literally saying you are going to lose your employment if you don't agree to have this vaccine injected into your body. That's a pretty extreme call in a in a modern liberal democracy now it may be totally justified by by COVID, depending on your opinion totally completely justified by the extreme circumstances but still in a modern liberal democracy that is an extreme call for a government of the day to be making and i think if the media didn't reflect some of the gravity around that call uh, those voices would have felt even more marginalized than they already did and i i actually think um i think the media largely Got the balance about right. So, and and if Michael, that's the issue you talked about before, the media being neutral, you can always pick examples. But I think there was a quite a lot, especially from the right, of accusation for media just being biased and having love affair with Jacinda at the time. Do you think that's a fair comment or no? I don't know that the media had a love affair with Jacinda. I mean, speaking from personal experience, uh, you know, I I I, I think any government of the day. Um, you know, faces tough questions. I mean, it, I actually think that the media's coverage of that period upon reflection generally reflected the public sentiment, which is that in the early stages of the pandemic response, I think many people, including the major opposition parties, would say that, or party, would say that uh, the handling of the early stages of the pandemic response were really good. I mean, look at the look at the 2020 election result. It's the first majority government we've ever had in the MMP environment, and it seems unlikely we're going to have another one anytime soon. Um, so I think I think maybe if people perceived it as glowing coverage, it was coverage that acknowledged what was generally um, perceived to be good leadership in an extremely trying moment. I don't know that necessarily um, this government's had an easy run in terms of media coverage. In fact, I. I th I think they've probably um, been held to account pretty robust, you know, in a pretty robust manner um, for the things that they have and haven't achieved. And you know, it'll be interesting to see how the October election goes down. But um, you know, if the if the polls are be to be believed at the moment, um, you know, whatever sentiment New Zealand voters had for a Labour led government in 2020, they don't necessarily have them now. Mm. So in, in the States, a lot of journalists wear their political colours on their sleeve. Do, do you think we should do that more uh, increasingly in New Zealand? And if, if so, what are yours? No, I don't. Um, I, I don't I don't think they should. I mean, yeah, I, I, I don't know that. Um, I don't know that having the partisan media in the US necessarily serves readers because I think um, or, or viewers or anything, because I think that um, people uh, just get themselves into bubbles, man. And it happens all the time, you know, like um, I would just be so uncomfortable when newspaper editorial boards would endorse candidates. Yeah. I was like, this is such a, this is such a foreign thing. Um, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I think, I think some, depending on whether they're journalists or broadcasters or however they want to define themselves, like, I don't think anyone's expecting Mike Hosking to vote for Labour this election, right? <laughs> like some, some people it's relatively obvious. Um, I personally am of the belief that, uh, that the more time I spend reporting on politics and interviewing politicians, the less certain I am um, about any kind of party necessarily. Mm -hmm. Like, I just think that no one and no party has a monopoly on good ideas. And 
that uh, the moment we get ourselves into a position where we think, oh, my party's always right, your party's always wrong, um, you're just, you, 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 you're, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, you've taken the red pill, whatever you want to say, like, I think it's, I think it's all over then. And so um, one of the things, personally, I always strive to do is just interrogate ideas with the most open mind possible. Mm. And so I, from personal experience, having been pretty close to politicians and, and policy a lot of the time, I truthfully feel no tribalism whatsoever. Like, I just, I really don't think this team is better than this team is better than this team is better than this team. I think, like, I like a bit of that, and 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 I'd like to cherry pick um, everything. I also think that um, if you were to, if you were to package up Labour's policy platform and package up National's policy platform to take the two centrist parties, the two parties that traditionally get the most vote in New Zealand, and you were to do three card Monty and mm. put them as the little ball <laughs> under the under the cup and go, okay, which is which? Take take a budget. Take a, take one of the budgets from any of the last few years. And you were to you were to mix them all up and say, okay, tell me which is Labour and tell me which is National. Yeah. I honestly think like so many people wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two. I think I think the differences between our major parties basically boil down to branding and a little bit of fiddling at the edges. Branding and fiddling at the edges. I don't think either party represents radical change from the other. And and maybe that's just the way New Zealanders want it. You know, like a plurality of New Zealanders um, who vote, vote for either Labour or National, or at least, um, you know, have done in the past. And yeah, you know, so, so, so with that in mind, it kind of makes no sense for... Um, you're, for you're, media to have to have partisan bias anyway. You'll be voting this election, though, I'm assuming. Don't you think it's fair for your viewers to know who you'd be voting for? Uh, first of all, uh, I'll vote, certainly, because I support democracy. Um, I don't know whether I will vote for a party or candidate. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that I vote and return an empty ballot so as to support democracy, but not to... Um, but not to yep you know, mm -hmm. um, support anyone in particular. But you're a swing voter. Also, also I, I, I seriously don't know who I would vote for. Mm. Um, and, and if I were to decide um, on a personal, you know, uh, on a decision for a party or candidate, um, m my job requires me to, to look at things with a, as neutral a perspective as possible. So, no, I, 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 there's no way I would... I would plan to tell my to tell my um, viewers or or listeners, uh, and I mean, it, it, you know, like it, it's a hard thing for for people to accept, and it's a hard thing to try and um, explain to people. But like, regardless of my personal views, I just have to attack every policy and every um, you know every every policy platform with the same degree of scrutiny, regardless of who presents it. And so that so yeah. It, and uh, it's funny, it's a, yeah, like, um, oh yeah. Do you think it's a noble thing for journalists to do, abstain from voting, or is it sort of a? It, I guess it's funny because it's a little bit sort of pro democracy, but it's also anti democracy because you're not you're not voting as well. Yeah, I guess. Um, well, that's why I suppose I could, you know, there's a conceivable um, scenario in which I would support democracy by by returning a ballot, but not <laughs> selecting any one candidate or party. <laughs> Which does feel like very um, kind of like I'm overthinking things a little bit, <laughs> um, but no, no, I don't. I mean, I, this is this is journalism, right? Like you have to, you have to be able to, especially political journalism, you have to be able to remove your own personal bias from your coverage. And I mean, I'm I'm hardly the first person to have to have to deal with that kind of challenge. And I feel comfortable about being able to do it. Which is not to say that I get every story or interview or. Um, you know, it, not so that I get all of that stuff right necessarily, but it is to say that I feel comfortable that I can attack stuff um, with uh, the same level of, of rigor and scrutiny, regardless of who is presenting an idea. Mm. Would you could, um, would you consider yourself a swing voter? You might, you don't have to like say like obviously you know who you voted for, but have you do you reckon you voted for different parties or been, been a consistent? No, I've I've definitely voted for different parties before. And and for different candidates ones. from different yeah from candidates from different um different parties 
I'm not going to say which ones. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, but no, I do. I consider myself a swing voter, not necessarily, but I, I really do think one of the most admirable qualities in a person is like a, a capacity for critical thinking. Mm. And I, I really aspire to that. I aspire to be in a position whereby I can look at something and have a value set which informs my opinions, but also look at an issue with um, enough critical thinking to not be, um, make a judgment call on it on the basis of who is presenting it. You know what I mean? Like, I, I really think um, it, it's an underrated quality to be genuinely open minded about stuff because. It, you, whenever you ask people, and, and you ask politicians this, does any one party or um, politician have a monopoly on good ideas? They all say, oh, of course not, of course not, of course not, right? And yet, um, so often I think, um, you know, if we f are to follow tribal instincts, we get into a place where we, for some reason, think that our team is always best and always knows best. Mm. Um, I just want to pick up on a point you said earlier about journalists being neutral. Do you think that journalists truly can ever be neutral? Like, can people actually be neutral when they do things? I think so. I, yeah, I, I think journalists can... I mean, journalists have have personal opinions and personal biases. I, I accept that. But I still think that when you go about approaching a story or an idea, you can apply the same degree of rigor and scrutiny to that idea regardless of who presents it and i think that is a good thing for journalists to aspire to and my experience is that um regardless of what you do you are always if you work in political journalism you are always accused of being partisan in some way shape or form i mean literally every week probably every day I would get messages on social media accusing me of being like a leftist shill or a Tory, like just constantly. Like, uh, like, and and the great irony is that sometimes the people who are calling you a Tory one week will be caught saying like, "Yes, you're such a you're you know you're best because you're on the left." The next week, like, literally the same people will be making both crit critiques of you. Um, and I mean, I'm not the only one to 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 note that it's just part of the job, right? But um. It, it, like just constantly, I just get a constant sea of, of shit, you know, of, of of messages who say from people who say, oh, you're biased in this way or you're biased in that way. So yeah, my, basically you can't win, and I've come to see that not winning is actually winning. Like not winning, being accused of being partisan from all sides yeah. is basically the equivalent of probably doing your job well. And how, how do you balance giving someone the opportunity to share their message with not profiling disinformation? So for an example, like Brian Tamaki, you know, when you're trying not to sort of legitimize some messaging, but you also recognize that there's a population that might want to hear some sort of message. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, we, we never covered and we never covered Brian Tamaki's party mm. or Hannah Tamaki's party in the last election. I didn't, didn't touch it. Didn't go near there. Didn't do it. Didn't do a single interview on it. Yeah, um, because we felt like uh, they didn't. The coverage of their party we felt was wildly disproportionate to the support levels they had in the public at large, and I think that was borne out by the polls, and it was certainly borne out by um, by the election result. I can't remember if this was twenty twenty or twenty seventeen, to be honest. But um, uh, and so I think. Part of our job is to try and give proportionate coverage to parties in which um, uh, you, you, coverage of parties and politicians that is proportionate to their kind of support level bases and with maybe a, a slightly greater weighting given to parties that are either in parliament or are likely to be in parliament. Would, would um, you... Would you interview new conservatives now and would you interview voices for freedom? I, I mean, they're sort of, they've faded out a little bit post the protest, but would you have interviewed them then and, and would you interview new conservatives now? Yeah, we have no plans to interview new conservatives now and we have no plans to interview voices for freedom now. Mm. Um, and, is, is... And, which is not to say that um, 
which is not to say that we're totally opposed to those parties or or their beliefs or anything like that. It's just to say that. Um, is that because they're not big enough though, or is that because yeah, of the yeah, 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 right. yeah. If 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 Voices for Freedom was polling at ten percent, we would be interviewing yep. Voices for Freedom, no, no doubt about it. And and I think um, uh, to your point, like uh, in in platforming disinformation, etc. I mean, m most of our political parties, the ones that are represented in government uh, in parliament at the moment, most of them. And and maybe this is a subjective thing, but I think most of them are not, um, you know, peddling in like in in disinformation on the mm -hmm. scale of you know COVID vaccines don't work or this is the COVID's a conspiracy or that 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 kind of level of thing, right? And so I think, um, but I think if you are diving into interviews on something, um as conspiratorial as that, I mean, those are, you know, conspiracy theories, um, then I think you need to bring an extra degree of rigor to the kind of challenging of the ideas. You know, you can't just be platforming it and going, oh, here's an opinion. Da -da -da -da. You have to be challenging that with the, you know, with, with a high degree of rigor. Do you think that the media though, like since you talk about, you kind of do decide who you are and aren't going to give platforms to to a degree. In terms of actual like issues, do you think the media do that as well? And I think a classic one that I think they're thinking of is um ram raids. You know, they make up such a small percentage of the overall crime, yet they're reported on in the media so often. Do you think yeah. you guys do actually have quite a lot of power about what people care about and or perceive to be as important? Yeah, good question. We definitely have power. We we certainly have power to to um you know, to to influence the the way that the public feels about issues and issues that are of greater priority to the public. Um, and, you know, arguably, if the media only reported on issues that were of the greatest importance to the future of New Zealand, then nine stories out of 10 would be climate change, right? So, so there are probably some other factors at play. Yep, definitely there are commercial factors at play and that, you know, media under the current economic models, which are under great stress, are incentivized to report on things that get clicks and eyeballs. That that definitely happens and probably will continue to happen for some time. At the same time, I think um, uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg situation sometimes with the, with the public. Like, it's true that ram raids are a tiny percentage of um, of overall crimes, for example. But they are a very, very public example of brazen crime, which we are not used to experiencing. And the number of ram raids, even though it's a small percentage of overall crime, has massively, massively, massively increased in recent years. So you know, should we, for example, be reporting on domestic violence, which has far higher rates and is arguably far more significant and you know, the overall um, societal impacts in New Zealand? Absolutely. But it's also not the sort of crime that is recorded on social media and put mm -hmm. out to the world. It doesn't have that sensational quality that, say, ram rays do, for example. So I do think there's a delicate balance, and I don't think the media always gets it right. I'm not going to um, defend the media. But I also, uh, you know, in that sense, but I also think that um, uh, it would be disingenuous for, for us as media not to report on a massive spike in what is a sensational and brazen form of crime that is kind of directly linked to economic insecurity and one that we haven't really seen in New Zealand before. I think it would be irresponsible for us not to give that any coverage. You mentioned that obviously domestic violence can't be reported on social media. Do you think social media and sort of the, sort of and the stories people care about on social media has quite an influence on what you guys report on as opposed to sort of the previous like, hard-hitting journalism would have been more prominent 20, 30 years ago? Well, I mean, funnily, yes and no, in that um, I think sometimes we have kind of rose-tinted glasses when we think about journalism of the past and stories of the past. You know, like the, in, in newspapers, there still used to be, you know, when newspapers were the big format in which everyone got lots of their news, you know, like physical, actual ink and paper newspapers uh i think a lot of people a lot of people then um were still driven by a sensational crime stories were still driven by you know celebrity gossip and that kind of thing 
So I don't know that social media has necessarily changed the kinds of stories that we're interested in. It probably has um, affected some of the stories that news outlets would cover in their, you know, would cover online. In that, in that, the one that gets me is when you see the thing being like, um, you know, like mummy, like hot inspo, fitspo model complains about this outrageous thing at the gym. And it's yeah. like such a gratuitous clickbait headline that there's no detail in the headline, but they're desperate for you to click on it. And it's accompanied by a photo of someone doing some ridiculous, you know, like, <laughs> you know, kind of showing off their butt or whatever, yeah. you know, like it's those, those are the ones that kill me. But I actually think um, despite the kind of perilous nature of um, media and, and the media um, um, funding models at the moment, um, I actually think that there is still really high quality journalism being produced it's perhaps just that um some of the some of those you know clickbaity stories um and and the sheer number of clickbaity stories um make people think that oh man you know this has totally gone to the dogs but to your to your question though i'm not sure that that's necessarily driven by social media i think it's probably driven um just by commercial incentives in the same way that traditionally newspapers were driven by you know if it bleeds it leads I, I Is mean, there nature, of, oh, you go, ben. I guess the, the nature of social media now, right? Like a lot of my friends are getting all their news from reels, TikTok and Instagram reels, and they're yeah. getting like headlines in like three seconds. And, you know, click, uh, pay per click journalism now is so much about getting that headline. And um, I mean, a couple of examples like New Zealand Herald having their, you know, feature piece as an op ed, or, and then the op ed's got um, to sort of, represent public opinion they've got two facebook comments on there right because it's sort of that sort of fast paced nature yeah. of journalism. how um and, and that sort of you know pe pe i guess young journalists coming into the, the the scene now you know you went through the broadcast school how optimistic do you feel that there is sort of you know the same i guess amount of jobs out there or the same space for sort of heavy hitting investigative journalism there's still the same funds available for that if we have really given into this um you know clickbait rapid style journalism yeah i i sometimes wonder if news will follow in the same way that um that that food has 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 been changed and it's kind of revolutionized so i think about like the fast food movement it came out of the came out of the us um and you know was was driven by the mcdonaldsization of all sorts of food heavy and preservatives um churned out as cheap as possible um and it's interesting to me that say 40 years on the parts of the world that are biggest on the vegan farm to table sustainable food movement are arguably the same markets that gave us the big mac like mm -hmm. it's interesting to me that um you know in those kind of elite you know elite american um markets people have come to really value high quality, nutritious food. And those are the same people who were driving a lot of the trends into fast food a few decades ago. So part of me, was, part of me, the, 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 the optimist in me hopes that media will go through a similar transition and that we'll have this kind of period where we are all doing the equivalent of binging on, you know, McDonald's and KFC for every meal. We are just having completely unnutritious or non-nutritious um sugar laden preservative heavy shit but that we're going to get to a point where we're like oh man this is not actually enriching my life in any way i feel terrible i have no energy um i can see that this is not necessarily good for my society or our democracy perhaps we need to find models that actually of 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 media funding that actually promote um, the kind of high quality, thoughtful, impactful, meaningful journalism that you're talking about. So that's what the optimist in me hopes for. How do we get to that point? No idea. <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that um, you, you, the problem is that we have these economic models at the moment, whereby it's kind of a race to the bottom for a lot of these news outlets. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, because advertising dollars are increasingly sucked up by the tech giants, um, it's very hard for, and because, you know, people don't turn on the TV at 
6 p.m. on the dot necessarily in the same numbers that they used to and because people don't buy a physical newspaper in the same numbers that they used to. Um, effectively, for the time being, we're making a value judgment. We're, we're valuing the convenience and expediency of the headlines on TikTok over um, over the the you know more nutritious um, you know new, news products. Um, I, and I, I don't know how we get past that. I mean, part of me thinks that there's a responsibility uh, on the social media companies, like the 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 digital companies that have um, enriched themselves through no small amount of using information and news generated by independent sources, which they're not paying for, which New Zealand's kind of addressing at the moment. Part of me wonders if that could be a, a solution, but I think maybe, you know, greater wholesale change is required in order to ensure that we still have a plurality and um, the kinds of media voices that are delivering, you know, the, the nutritious journalism that we say we want. Part of this though is also on consumers, right? Like, and, and, and on those of us who read news, like we all say we value hard hitting journalism. We all say we want, um, you know, the, the thoughtful analyses and, and careful investigations and stuff like that. But what do we do with our thumb? What do we click on? There's a reason that you've got the gym influencer complaining about someone taking a photo of her or whatever, there's a reason that that's at the top of your news feed. There's a reason that the um, inflammatory editorial is at the top of your news feed is because people are clicking on it. And so at some point as well, I think we as you know, consumers and we as a society need to um, kind of put our thumbs where our mouths are. Do you think that we should potentially, and I guess my best is the way to try and look to solve it, is have more state money? funding of media and I guess if that we do that do you think that then that leads to a bias because I guess like I, from my you know channels I hear that TV1 and RNZ both get accused um of being biased because they have got more state funding yeah it's funny I mean see that see that that's interesting in itself right like TVNZ um TVNZ is owned by the government but it doesn't it doesn't uh, get funding as such, like it has to return a dividend, which it hasn't returned, but um, it's supposed to return a, di a dividend to its to its owner. It's New Zealand on air funding for some shows, but um, so does TV3, so does stuff. So, the, um, so you know, the, 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 that New Zealand on air funding goes to a range of different projects, and most of them aren't related to news and journalism. So, for example, like the government doesn't pay any money for one the, the one news at six o'clock. Like there's no there's no government funding going into that. But there are still perceptions, like you say, around um, yeah, ar around TVNZ getting government funding and being government funded. It's simply it's simply not the case. Um, RNZ, 100% government funded. So that's a great example of an organization that gets state funding, um, not necessarily guaranteed for a long period, but different governments will fund it in different ways. Um, and arguably... I mean, if you look at RNZ's news product, it's quite different to uh, what you get from Stuff or what you get from the Herald or TVNZ or Three. Clearly, there are no um, commercial incentives driving stories about the gym blogger once again or the you know the 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 inflammatory kind of editorial. Um, that being said, I do think there is a very careful. Um, I, I think there's a risk when it comes to state funding that you can contribute to perceptions around bias. Mm -hmm. And the great example of that is this, we've recently had this um, public interest journalism fund, $55 million was distributed throughout different media platforms, including the show that I work for, for Q&A, um, by New Zealand on air. And $55 million in the context of government spending is like a rounding error. It's infinitesimal, it's tiny, right? And yet the perceptions around trust, I would argue, uh, have potentially been quite badly damaged because there are a lot of people who think you're government funded, you're getting a message direct from the government and so you're saying whatever they want to say, mm -hmm. which just couldn't be further from the truth. Like it, there's just like we get no, and, and if anyone objectively sits down and looks at our show, for example, and the kind of treatment we give government ministers versus other politicians. There's there's no special treatment whatsoever, right? But people believe what they want to believe. And if they know that money's going into 
um, an organization to produce news, then often they, um, whether it's warranted or not, there is a there is a question they have over bias and whether or not that media outlet is merely presenting the government's view. There are organizational structures that allow you to get beyond that. So you can build in structures that really clearly delineate between the source of the funding, i.e. the government, and editorial decisions. And so for Radio New Zealand, for example, I, I, you know, I think they have um, a setup that completely distinguishes them from the government, and yet everyone still calls them Radio Red all the time, right? <laughs> um, and so, so that's the that's the kind of risk you, you have. And and maybe maybe there are ways where we do it. You know, maybe it is government funding. I mean, at the moment they're pursuing this bargaining deal whereby the tech giants effectively have to give money to news producers in New Zealand. I mean, maybe that's a way that we look at things in the future. We say, right, you know, the likes of Meta and Google are so powerful in New Zealand, but so much of the information that they essentially trade on comes from these reputable news sources who aren't being um, remunerated in the same ways that they were 30 years ago. So maybe we have some sort of structure whereby a percentage of profits or a certain sum of money every year goes from those digital giants into news producers without the government being the middleman. You know, maybe there's some way we can structure that, but I don't, I don't know how you go about doing that. I guess we're in the middle of an election cycle. Um, how do you, or sorry, in the middle of an election campaign, how do you sort of view media's role in an election? You've talked a lot about sort of, you know, journalists not being biased and stuff. What do you think your job is? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I feel like our job is to is to cover the campaign fairly. So, like, reflect what's happening in the campaign. Um to share different policies of different parties and to scrutinize the different policies of different parties. There's an added um, kind of uh, element, I suppose, when covering the government in that uh, the government has six years or Labour has six years in government um, on which it can be measured as well. And of course, National has the period for which it was in government before Labour was in for which it can be scrutinized as well. And I think that's an important thing. Like it's not just what you are promising, it's whether or not you have kept promises from in the past and whether or not you have shown the capacity in government to actually deliver on your promises. Now, I often think that that's something that's kind of lost in these, um, in political campaigns. It just comes down to who is promising what, but there's a massive difference between campaigning to be in office and actually governing like they're just completely different skill sets. And I think that um, sometimes, uh, you, you know, it, it can be dangerous in political campaigns if you just focus on the campaign and the horse race rather than the kind of capacity to actually deliver on promises and whether or not promises have been kept in the past. And so I think that's, a, that's an important thing that we will focus on as well.